we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God but you have to recognize this lack because you recognize the glory from an experience of the eternal realm once you recognize this possibility of experiencing the glory then you will recognize your own lack and go to Jesus it's not that the society around us is not leprous the entire society is sick but they do not recognize that they need God it was only this one man who came to Jesus in Matthew 8 that recognized that he was a leper all the signs were there for him to see he recognized that he was a leper and he went to the Lord the basic issue in Matthew 8 2 is how can a son in the physical condition a leper worship the Lord God because it says a leper worship him and Matthew uses the Greek word for genuine worship in Matthew 8 2 which is poskuneo indicating that there was worship there was an experience of the Father as taught by Jesus in John 4.24 not Sibomahi the term used by Jesus in Matthew 15.9 what I'm asking is how can a son in the physical condition worship the Father? that's the question that I am raising to you how can a son in the physical condition experience the glory and still not be healed because it's just a leper worshipped him he asked for healing as evidenced by the second part of the verse Matthew 8 2 since we have learned that an experience of the glory of God is an experience of healing where the physical condition is neutralized this is the first issue in this reading also another issue is we know that this event like many in Jesus' life indicates a deeper truth a truth of the reality of the eternal realm the question is in the reading is Jesus a shadow of the Father or is Jesus a shadow of the eternal Christ this is another issue that is raised by Matthew 8 now as I have already proven to you on more than one occasion a shadow never ever fulfills all the aspects of the reality since if it did then the image of shadow would become the reality that the shadow represents the shadow and the event in Matthew 8, 1 to 3 is to teach us something about Christ and about God the original question that I seek to answer is how can a son how can one who belongs to God who is created as an original spiritual creation before the material creation experience worship experience the glory and still not be healed therefore has to ask for healing as is evidenced in Matthew 8 2 the second part of the verse says from the floor of the verse he worships and then he asks for healing well we understand that this is not the reality of what takes place in the eternal realm are you with me? you can't worship and still ask for healing because 
the act of worshipping the Father, the act of experiencing the glory is how we get healed. The only way that we can solve this question and reveal the full impact of the mystery is to recognize that Matthew 8, 2 is divided into two separate parts. The first part is, and behold, there came a leper and worshipped him. And the second part, which is separated, it exists as a separate existence from the first part. The second part is saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And clean is a shadow for heal. Now this can only be revealed in the expanded mind because the old man nature has been reversed, neutralized or healed. We are in the first part of the verse where it says, and worship him. It should be obvious that since we only worship the Father, as we are taught by Jesus in John chapter 4, that worship is of the Father and not of Christ. Therefore, that Jesus is a shadow for the Father as he exists in glory. Are you there with me? Since the leper is worshipping the Lord, then we have to understand that who the Lord is, is not Christ, but is the Father. Since by Jesus' own words, he teaches us that worship is of the Father. as expressed by the fact the leper approached him for healing that he worshipped him we worship the Father, not Jesus therefore in the first part of Matthew 8, 2 Jesus who the leper approached is a shadow for the Father taking note that the Father is Christ as he abides in his glory that the Father is Christ before he became our Christ and as he abided and abides in his glory forever that the Father left his glory to become our Christ even while he remained God the key part of the first part of the verse Matthew 8 2 is that the person or being worshipped the Father just reminding you one more time that as a shadow only some aspects of the shadow will match the reality others will not these aspects of the shadow can therefore be disregarded in as far as the essence is concerned I'm not telling you to disregard the facts of the physical event I'm saying that there are certain things about the physical event that we can discard when we are considering the essence of what the shadow represents some aspects of the shadow can therefore be disregarded and it is important to fix our attention on what is important to what is being pointed to for example the fact that it says a leper worshipped him we can disregard that it was a leper someone in the physical condition because as soon as we worship the father we are healed and we are no longer lepers that's the easy part In the second part of verse Matthew 8, 2, where it says, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean, indicates 
that the leper is in an unclean existence and speaks to the Lord Jesus. This is the defining element that distinguishes it from the first part of the verse. What we need to fix our attention on is on the fact that the person or being is a leper in the physical condition. Whereas in the first part of the verse he is already healed. In the second part of Matthew 8 2, the key is the condition of the leper that he is unhealed. Since the leper is asking for healing in the second part of the verse and we only ask the father for healing we may tend to think that the person being asked for healing is the father and that it should follow that Jesus is also a shadow of the father in the second part of the verse not so Not when you consider that in the second part of verse 8 the leper still remains unhealed. That's the key to understanding the second part of verse Matthew 8 2. No. When you consider that in the second part of verse 8 the leper still remains unhealed remember that in a spiritual sense the end is always started first because that is the reality that exists in the eternal realm then God goes to explain how it got that way In a spiritual sense, the end is always stated first to reflect the reality that is, and then the beginning is stated second. Therefore, we would say that the leper asked for healing and then worshiped the Lord. The verse would therefore have to be reversed and it would read something like this saying I saying Lord if thou wilt thou canst make me clean and then behold came to worship him the second part is important in that it says saying Lord if thou wilt thou canst make me clean is to remember that the leper asked for healing remember the condition of the leper is key as people in the physical condition we cannot approach God we first have to approach Christ so that we can be partially healed using that term very loosely quote unquote the experience of righteousness the experience of the original spiritual creation therefore in the strictest of senses we are not lepers when we are in Christ when we are hidden in Christ the process of healing has already begun when we are in Christ and the rest is automatic worship follows but we first have to submit to Christ we cannot approach the Father and ask Him to cleanse us we first have to approach Christ and this is the issue 
in our disease we cannot approach God only Christ I am not looking for mostly and primarily at the asking but at the nature of the leper and that the asking is done when we are still lepers in the physical condition in total lack therefore I have to say that in the second part of the verse Jesus is a shadow of the eternal Christ and that we can approach him being in the physical condition once we submit to him uh, and are in continuous submission to him over the long run being lepers to summarize in the first part of the verse Jesus is a shadow of the Father Christ in glory and that in the second part Jesus is a shadow of the eternal Christ how is it possible that Jesus can be a shadow for both Father and Christ because all are the same person and where Jesus is a physical manifestation of God made possible through Mary's womb what the Lord says is because of who I am and was from the beginning and still am as I existed before I became your Christ in the heavenlies long before the creation of the physical universe and long before I was made man the question then becomes how do we ask for healing how do we ask Jesus Christ to take us to the Father for healing or how do we communicate with Christ that we want him to resurrect us with himself in the age of glory or how do we communicate to Christ that we want to re-emerge with him in the age of glory for our healing it's simple our communication is done through submission to the declaration we communicate this desire for our healing by our submission to the declaration in Jesus Christ if you desire healing then just simply submit to what Christ shows you in himself everything else follows automatically in a fail safe system prepared before the physical creation we ask for healing by submission to Christ not once but in the long run keeping ourselves in the spiritual way because of the declaration in Christ do not ask with your mouth while rejecting the living Christ Matthew 15 again the reason why I say we ask Jesus Christ for healing by submission is because after we submit everything else follows automatically it is guaranteed we do not have to do anything else we do not ask the Father for anything we are in Christ hid and we re-emerge with Christ as he automatically resurrects himself in the age of glory with us in him we do not have to ask the Father after we are in Christ but for us to get in Christ we must receive him we must accept him in the declaration we do not have to ask the Father after we are in Christ it happens automatically we receive healing automatically once Christ makes us acceptable to the Father we automatically experience the original experience of the original spiritual creation coming to life which continues to exist constant know that when we speak of submission we speak of lifetime dedication to obedience to the declaration in Christ not that we become healed saved once and for all but that we commit ourselves to the ongoing struggle against our physical condition which is what Christianity is all about it's about an ongoing continuous struggle against who we basically are 
we commit ourselves to the fight against constantly remaining in the physical condition. We commit ourselves to the constant interruption of the physical condition because of the spiritual connection and submission to the declaration. We dedicate ourselves to not being stuck in the physical condition in the long run. It's all about the alleviation from the physical condition because of submission to Christ declaration as we reach towards the end of our spiritual way in Christ. I'm coming back to the original question of offense and why we are offended at the word. Christ Jesus exists in suffering so that we can approach him outside of his glory. I'm continuing, in essence, from the event in Matthew 8. We can approach Christ while we remain in our physical condition. What I've described to you as partially healed to indicate the fact that we are on our way to healing because we are in Christ and nothing else. But we can only approach Christ because He continues to exist as the eternal Christ forever, experiencing our shortcomings and our weaknesses and sin, and that we are the cross of Jesus in the eternal realm. Christ Jesus exists in suffering so that we can approach him outside of his glory so that he can resurrect us in the experience of the glory. It is Jesus Christ who receives us and makes us acceptable to the Father righteous so that the Father of the glory can heal us. Coming back to the first point about the offense. Many get offended in the world at the physical teaching, at the Theosebus, which is a dim reflection of Christ like Jesus is. But if you do not pay attention to the word that offends, if you do not give heed to the word that offends and repent, then on the last day, it is God who will become offended at you and exhibit this offense by outpouring not his love, not his compassion, not his mercy, but by outpouring his wrath. At the present moment you get offended in the world because God is offended at your physical condition and he sends the word to match your own existence and circumstance. The word comes defined by Christ in order to get you to repent and therefore since the word is defined by Christ it comes to address your state of lack which offends God. Don't think that you are offended at the word first. God is first offended at you and he sends the word to address your own lack that makes you offended. The word offends you because you offend God. In other words, the word is tailored to suit your physical condition the natural man. The word is tailor made in order to address your lack. It is because you exist in suffering and lack that God sends the word which is abrasive to you and your guilt. You're offended. The offense comes because of your guilt, because of your shame. The offense is triggered because you thought your shame was hid from everyone and now it's revealed to the entire world. And that's in your own mind. 
offense comes, you are offended because the word reveals your shame. It reminds you of your shame and you become defensive being offended. Whereas duplication and religion buries your shame. Duplication does not touch your shame and allows you to feel comfortable in your shame. You are just one among many to be excused by the false teacher. The question is why? Why does God offend us? Or rather, should I say, why does God remind us of our shame? Or why does God see it fit to deal with our physical condition? Is it just because we offend Him as we exist in the physical condition? Or is it that He has compassion on our suffering which we apparently do not see? Is it His intention to offend or is it His intention to deliver us? Is it his intention to be abrasive to us? Because this is what offense is. To be upset and angry at God because of his glory. But this is not the attitude of sons. This is the attitude of the oppressor and the Lord's enemy. It is his intention to be abrasive to us. Or does he desire to heal us? This is God's purpose in Christ. Christ struggles with us. Christ struggles to stretch us back onto the track of faith. Christ struggles to tear us away from our suffering in the physical condition so that we can once again enjoy the glory of God. Christ struggles with us as he sends the physical teaching to us that just happens to conflict with our reliance on the carnal mind of the old man in the old nature under the old administration of what else but the law of sin and death in order to rescue us from sin and death to remind us that all is not well with our soul please tell me to Matthew 13 and verse 44 Matthew 13:44 Again, the kingdom of heaven and for all practical purposes kingdom of heaven is the same as the kingdom of God. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field the which when a man hath found he hideth and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and by that field he buys the field he doesn't just buy the treasure that's hid in the field he buys the entire field the entire eternal realm that is our gift from Jesus Christ when it says at the beginning of the verse the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid it's the treasures of the eternal realm that are hid in the eternal realm why do we say that the churches are hid why did Jesus say in the parable that this treasure is hid because the spiritual works of the eternal realm giving us access to the glory are mysteries hid in the eternal realm and our mysteries that cannot be physically manifested in the physical creation nor 
can they be physically communicated so they remain unseen to the carnal eye as they remain buried in a realm that is held that is hid from the old man the spiritual works that are referred to by the shadow as the treasure these spiritual works can only be communicated to others by Christ if these others are submissive continuously to Christ so when you discover when you submit to Jesus Christ and you have access to the treasures of heaven which represent the spiritual works of the Rima age that gives you access to the original spiritual creation which makes you righteous acceptable to the Father so that Christ can resurrect you into the age of glory for your healing once you experience that you are willing to give up all the obstacles that stand in the gate of the entrance into the spiritual way because it is a spiritual way it is a continuous moving towards God and we don't receive more and more of God what we receive is an experience of the Father the first time we experience the full extent of our healing from all the glory that there is in the eternal realm in as far as it is possible for us to experience it as we abide in this world we don't receive more of God as we walk in the spiritual way it is the same experience of deliverance that we encounter at the end of a walk than that which we encounter at the beginning of the walk there's no difference in the experience of the healing from an encounter with the Father I'd like to make a notation that we began this teaching on October 16, 1996 with the same issue of the kingdom and with these parables that are mysteries Matthew 13, 34 and 35 All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables and without a parable spake he not unto them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying I will open my mouth in parables I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world and Matthew 13 13 and 11 therefore speak I to them in parables because they are seeing see not and hearing they hear not neither do they understand verse 11 he answered and said unto them because it is given unto you as the sons of God who are submissive to Jesus Christ to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it is not given so if you are submissive to Jesus Christ then these treasures that I have discovered which I am endeavoring to pass on to you in the person of Jesus Christ can only be experienced by you if you yourself are also in submission to Jesus Christ these treasures these spiritual works remain hidden in the eternal realm and cannot be communicated by me to you that is why I say 
that you still need Jesus Christ that I am not sufficient for your deliverance and that's the reason why I give you these definitions as being led by Jesus Christ so that you can have access if you are submissive that you can have access to these same treasures that I experience so that you can come to know and submit to Jesus Christ for your own deliverance and healing Matthew 13, 45 and 46 Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a seeking goodly pearls, looking for treasures that are defined as pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he just found one pearl. He didn't find many pearls, it was just one pearl, went and sold all he had and bought it. The one pearl represents who we are in Christ. That is made known to us in Christ and by Christ. That we are willing to sell all the obstacles blocking our entrance to the spiritual way which gives us continued access to the glory through the spiritual way. The purpose of this teaching, like all other teachings, is for your own benefit is to entice you to begin your assigned course with Jesus Christ so that your own work will be manifested to the rest of the body for the purpose of the strengthening of the same body but it all begins with one simple fact of our submission to Jesus Christ it must begin there because that is the beginning point it must come at the point where we say yes to Jesus not in attitude but in fact where we say yes to all he has shown us in himself so that he can recognize that we mean business with him what is Christianity all about? It's all about a struggle against our own carnality. It's about a struggle against our own flesh. And all of us suffer at all times from this weakness and from this lack of the glory of God. This is why Christ declares to us so that he can alleviate this situation of suffering that we perhaps do not recognize is lack. Christianity is all about a struggle that is personal. And this struggle is not against others, it is against our own carnality, against our own lack, and against our own sin. It is not to the benefit of the minister that you submit yourself to Jesus Christ or that you come to church. It is for your own benefit that you submit to Jesus Christ so that you can come to know and experience what this healing is that I'm speaking about. Christianity defines our lack. It defines our carnal nature and gives us the remedy in the person of Jesus Christ as he presents himself to us in the spiritual revelation or the declaration Christianity is about struggle and Webster's too says that struggle is to exert muscular energy as in opposition to a material force or mass the struggle is to be vigorously involved with a task, problem or undertaking. There has to be energy expended in this struggle against your own carnality. 
the minister can't do it for you, the bearer can't do it for you, you have to do it for yourself. Webster too says that struggle is also to make a strenuous effort to strive. There has to be sweat. There has to be calories eaten up. To struggle is also to contend against, as in a contest against lust or to compete with your loss. The struggle is to progress with difficulty. There is no progress without a struggle, without difficulty. This is perhaps what we are afraid of. We are afraid of this struggle that is identified in Christianity. But it doesn't matter if no one else in the world believes that we can know the eternal realm which is the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter if no one else believes. Once you can be healed after the same principle of this worship of the Father, this is what counts that your healing takes place in the eternal realm and that you can know for sure by this foretaste of glory divine because we can taste it now you can have this down payment of the taste of the glory as proof as the assurance that God really exists that there is in fact an afterlife because we all need proof even as we walk in the spiritual way we still need to remind ourselves that this glory which is tangible and real is what we shall receive full time, all the time in eternity in Jesus Christ. Our reward now for the struggle, what keeps us in the struggle is this temporary experience of the glory of God which we desire to continue to exist in an experience and we ought to be able to struggle against any spirit that comes to hinder us from doing God's will we have the basic guidelines that are present in scripture to indicate to us that there is in fact something called the kingdom of God which we can interact with and experience now if we submit to Jesus Christ is the condition never mind what others say it doesn't hurt to be in the Christian minority remember that we are a minority and we will continue to remain a minority as long as as the history of mankind exists but it doesn't matter because in the eternal realm we are the majority we are the only ones who are there and as people who come to church you need the assurance that the glory gives you you need the down payment of the temporary taste of the glory to usher you onwards in the struggle you need submission to Jesus Christ to give you this foretaste of glory divine you cannot have a foretaste of this glory divine unless you are obedient to the living God Jesus Christ it is not about praying it is about submission it is not about works it is about submission And Jesus makes it exceedingly easy for us who desire to be healed from this ill nature that has us oppressed and depressed. This lack of the glory of God 
is what oppression is. It is to exist outside of our original nature in Jesus Christ that we are kept back from this experience because you have been seduced away by the oppressor to keep you locked out of the eternal realm and into the physical realm. He has done a job on you. He has deceived you. He has seduced you into rejecting the declaration so that he can have a handle on you and control you and keep you oppressed. Which means separated from the glory of God. Know that you are in suffering and in lack. Know that all Jesus wants to give you is the mysteries of the kingdom for you to share with yourself. So that you yourself are liberated from this being separated from God. Being separated from the glory of God. This is all we desire. This is the purpose of the church and there is no other purpose in the church but to offer you the inspiration into the eternal realm so that you can come to know and experience Christ for yourself and submit to him to the full extent of your healing and deliverance from this oppression. The oppressor rejoices at your lack. He instigates those around you to keep you separated, to keep you seduced away from God. And what is the seduction? The seduction is the 30 pieces of silver. It is what the oppressor offers you of the physical realm interacting with your lust. The 30 pieces of silver signify and represent your lust and it represents potential material prosperity that you will never accomplish because whatever you acquire in this world is always fading away and will never last. Christianity is all about the struggle to maintain our access to the eternal realm. The Christian struggle is about our selling ourselves to follow Christ into the eternal realm where he can lead us to himself in glory for healing. This is the purpose of Christianity. It is to get everyone involved in the body of Christ. It is to get everyone to look beyond themselves. To stop looking inward, outward to Jesus Christ. For the purpose of serving the rest of the body for your own healing. The purpose of serving others is so that you can accomplish healing in Jesus Christ and if you are not serving the rest of the body then you are not a part of the body of Christ you cannot be performing some function for the rest of the body and expect that you are a part of the body of Christ there must be some link, some physical connection, some relationship as Paul had with all the church even when he was absent from them, ministering to them in letters. There has to be some physical link between you and the rest of the body of Christ in order for you to maintain access to your healing. You follow what I'm saying? Without service there can be no healing. Without service you cannot be a member of the body of Christ in the upper room which is not this physical body. 
but the body in the heavenly Jerusalem in the heavenly Mount Zion and why does the word offend? why does the word come defined by Jesus Christ to offend us? because God is offended at us that is why he sends the word so that we can recognize our lack and our suffering for the purpose of turning away from our lack and towards God that's the purpose the word offends us because we offend God remember the word is defined by Jesus Christ by God himself and as long as we are in lack as long as we are in suffering it is the purpose of the church to struggle with you to try and stretch you back on the track of faith in a continuous assigned course that allows you to be continuously healed even if it is in an intermittent way why does Jesus offend us? because we offend him why does God send the word to offend us? because we exist in shame and shame is the trigger walking along with the word to remind us that we are not justified that there is something lacking in our life that there is suffering in our lives that we can live a better life and it doesn't matter if no one else like I said before it doesn't matter if no one else believes that the dispensation of water baptism has passed it doesn't matter if no one believes that the dispensation of the physical law of shadows of the image has passed it doesn't matter once we experience that the dispensation of the spiritual way has arrived in our lives this is the message of Acts chapter 1 that the dispensation of water baptism is no longer in force and for sons for Isaiah and for David and for Abraham they were never in force because they always functioned in the system called the New Testament as they walked with God the dispensation of water baptism has certainly passed and the dispensation the one that allows us to interact with the eternal realm is here so that you can experience healing in a true sense the dispensation of water baptism has passed and the dispensation of the kingdom of God and our interaction with it has arrived once you submit to Jesus Christ the dispensation of water baptism has passed and the dispensation of the system called the New Testament has come into our lives if we are submissive to Jesus Christ otherwise we are going to be into image worship or idolatry according to 1 Peter 4.3 if we reject the living God the eternal spirit Christ Jesus then all we have left at our disposal is the shadow is the image and it's darkness because we shall be separated from the kingdom of God which is the eternal realm 
This teaching cannot be made any clearer. If there's anything lacking in it, it's not for lack of the word. Matthew 13, 45 and 46. We need to find as a people looking for treasure, as a people looking for the wealth of pearls, we need to find that one pearl that we are willing to sell everything in our life, that we are willing to sell our own agenda for that we are willing to sell everything that our lust is manifested in talking about the satisfaction of that lust so that we can enter into the way that is of Christ in the eternal realm that is full of opposition So what can those who oppose us do to us if we are following Jesus Christ? We need to find that one Paul that we are willing to sell everything and everyone in the world in order to accomplish in Jesus Christ. There should be nothing standing in our way to our acceptance of the declaration that comes to us in Jesus Christ. No person or thing in the world should be persuading us from entering onto the way that is above. 